Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Arbel Harvak. And uh, the work that I'll be presenting today is a uh, joint work with Anand Pascal and my advisor, Jonathan Pritchard. In population genetics, uh, we ask how evolutionary processes shape patterns of genetic variation, such as allele frequencies. And one of the most basic objects one can talk about in this respect is the distribution of allele frequencies, otherwise known as the site frequency spectrum, or SFS. Now, the SFS can be thought of in various ways, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll just be focusing on a very simple summary of this distribution, uh, which I'll call the fraction of rare variance. And uh, that is uh, the fraction of variance within a, a sample that we see uh, uh, in only one or two copies uh, within the sample. So since the SFS is uh, shaped by evolutionary processes, it can be used for inference uh, of quantities uh, that we're interested about uh, the same processes. Uh, so two prominent examples are in demographic inference and in uh, inference about natural selection. And with all of the, these different things that go into determining the shape of the distribution, uh, it has been historically convenient uh, to assume that there is one evolutionary force that we actually don't have to think about too much, and that is uh, mutation and mutation rates. And uh, this assumption did not come out of nowhere. Uh, it was uh, first suggested by uh, Motu Kimura, and uh, it's based on the following rationale. So let's imagine that we have a sample of uh, individuals from the human population, and we can think about the tree or genealogy underlying the sample at a particular genomic site. Uh, so the overall length of branches in these trees can be thought of as a time that mutation had to accumulate. So as long as the sample is rather small, we'd either see zero or one mutations, and we can neglect the possibility of seeing uh, more of than one mutation in the sample because uh, that's going to be very rare. Now, since Kimura suggested this model, a lot of time has passed. Uh, technology has advanced a lot, and we can now get huge trees. So with these large samples, we should think about much larger genealogies. And therefore, uh, we, can, uh, perhaps, we should perhaps concern ourselves with the possibility of getting more than one mutation within a sample. If that is indeed the case, then the sites that would uh, tend to exhibit recurrent mutations would be sites of uh, higher mutation rates. The effect of such recurrent mutation would be an elevation in the leak frequency. And therefore, this uh, variance would uh, tend to be less rare. And again, let me emphasize that uh, a lot of the inference schemes that are based on the SFS uh, really heavily rely on this infinite site assumption. And therefore, we should really uh, ask ourselves whether it still holds for the large samples uh, that we deal with today. So uh, to deal with this question, we uh, use the largest polymorphism data set currently available, which is uh, the exact data set. And uh, what exact did is aggregated uh, together many exom studies and perform joint calling in over 60,000 individuals. Now, what we saw in the data was a clear signature of an effect of mutation rate on the site frequency spectrum. So the SFS is again summarized uh, by the fraction of uh, rare variants, that is singletons or doubletons here. And the different data points conferred to different uh, mononucleotide mutation types, as well as CPG mutations. Uh, which in turn uh, correspond to different rates of mutation. And we can see that the higher the mutation rate, the lower the fraction of rare variance. So we can already say uh, with some confidence that there is an effect of mutation rate on the site frequency spectrum. And you may wonder uh, how big is this effect. So uh, obviously we can see a big difference in the SFS between CPGs and, TP in, uh, and non CPG mutations. Uh, but how important are these differences of, of uh, 4 or 5 percent between the other mutation types? And the answer is that they're uh, very important for downstream inference. So uh, here in this toy example of uh, demographic inference, uh, we try to infer the uh, recent uh, parameters of the recent exponential growth of the human population. And what we see is that the mutational composition actually has a dramatic effect on the histories that we'd be inferring for humans. Um, and you can imagine a similar effect uh, for uh, inference about selection, uh, about natural selection, where the mutational composition would really matter a lot. 
Interestingly, uh, we also saw this effect on the SFS within mutation types and not only uh, between types of mutation in sequence. So uh, here we're looking at the, uh, whether a variant of a particular type lies in the template or uh, happen on the template or the coding strand. And uh, here's an example of what I mean by a, an A to G template mutation. And we can see that a few of the mutation, uh, of the mutation types actually have um, a big difference, a significant difference between the coding and the template strand. And actually, the same mutation types that exhibit this significant difference are the one implicated in literature to have uh, some asymmetry in the rates of uh, transcription coupled repair. So that could suggest a mechanism behind this. Another example of within mutation type variation is uh, in association with chromatin states. So uh, again, we're stratifying the mutations by their type and also by the chromatin state in which they lie. And we can see, and um, what I'd like you to see here is how much variation we can see within CPGs uh, just as a, um, as a function of the, the chromatin state in which the, the variant lies, whereas for all the other mutation types, there is really very modest association with chromatin states. So the take home from uh, this analysis and the previous one is just that we can have, we can see the effect of um, variation within mutation types. So we next wanted to see if we can use a signature that um, mutation rate variation leaves on the SFS to actually learn something uh, about mutation rate variation itself. And to do this, we fitted different uh, mutational models to the observed data of differences between SFS of mutation types. So as we already said, the infinite sites model would suggest the same SFS for all mutation types. And therefore, uh, it provides a poor fit to the, to the data. However, even when you consider a simple finite sites model, uh, where we do account for the for the effect of recurrent mutation when the mutation rate gets high, uh, we still improve the fit to data by very little. It turns out that only when we um, considered this effect of within mutation type variation were we able to capture the large differences between the SFS of different mutation types. Okay, at this point, you may ask yourself whether this effect is only something that we should be concerned about with large samples or whether any of this matters for uh, small end studies. So to look into this question, uh, with this motivation in mind, we, um, we computed the expected SFS and expected fraction of rare variance across a range of sample sizes uh, smaller than the exact data set sample size. And uh, what we see was, was saw is kind of interesting. So of course, smaller sample sizes have the obvious limitation of uh, limiting the resolution of our analysis because small n implies higher variance. But this is not what I'd like to share with you today. Uh, what we saw was an interesting uh, biasing effect. So uh, let's see what it is. So uh, here I'm showing the SFS of CPG and non-CPG uh, transitions. And in the data, uh, as we discussed, CPG mutations have a much lower fraction of variance. However, if we look at the much smaller sample sizes, on the order of hundreds or thousands, we see a reversing trend where CPG mutations actually seem to have higher fraction of rare variance. So let me try and give some intuition behind this. So let's just consider two categories of sites and we can forget about mutation rates for the time being. Uh, the blue category and the red category and the blue category has much more rare variation in the population. If our sample size is, ra is uh, rather small, uh, the, the rare variation part of the distribution, this left side of the distribution, would actually carry very little weight, and the intermediate frequencies would actually matter much more for what we see in our small sample. And we might get this uh, reversing trend where we think that the uh, red, red uh, category has more rare variation. Now, uh, let me emphasize again that this is a general effect and a biasing effect. We're talking about the expectation here. Um, that could happen for any two categories of sites. So even if we were interested in inferring uh, selective constraint, for instance, uh, we could have the same biasing effect where the category that is more selected in the, uh, that is under more purifying selection in the population would exhibit less rare variation in a small sample. 
So take home message from this is that we can have this uh, biasing effect in comparison between two categories when we look at very small samples. Okay, so in summary, we saw that mutation rate variation really leaves a substantial effect, really has a substantial effect on this, the SFS. Uh, we discussed the fact that uh, downstream inference uh, would be very much affected by this, uh, um, by this variation, and therefore we should perhaps rethink the way that we incorporate mutation uh, into this uh, inference schemes. And the last thing that I'd like you to take away from this uh, talk is the fact that we can leverage this uh, signature that mutation rate variation leaves on the SFS uh, to learn something back about the um, biological process of mutation itself, as we've seen an example of. And uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Jonathan and Anand again, and also the organizers for this uh, wonderful conference, and uh, the people that helped in putting this together. Uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I was wondering um, how what you've done in, interacts or relates to the, uh, those papers of Andy Clark which uh, regarded uh, fast changing, rapidly growing populations from which the samples would have been taken, showing that uh, more rapid population growth actually leads to a higher frequency in the left-hand end of the SFS. Um, I'm not sure I'm familiar with this paper, so I'd be happy to discuss this later. Is it, uh, I'm, maybe Jonathan, you, you know those papers? Uh, yeah, papers is that one of the ones that, uh, is it, was he the first author on that? Um, so we agree that there's a, there's a very large number of very rare variants, um, but I, I, th I think the novelty of our Bell's observations is that, um, is that the actual fractions of rare variants vary a lot across mutational types. So it's, it's implying that both demography and, and mutation rate are important for, um, for, de for re the resulting SFS you see in data. Thank you.